I am going to pull out an Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. My survivor friends, you are not a tumor. Eh, eh, not too bad. In regards to your cancer treatment, do you feel you are or were being treated as a disease or as a person? Did anyone on your medical team ever ask you about your goals? And did you feel part of the decision-making process? Patient-centered care and shared decision-making focus on treating the whole person. Therefore, considering not just the disease, but also your emotional and mental well-being. You may not be surprised that taking this comprehensive holistic approach can make a significant difference in treatment satisfaction and recovery. Welcome to the Recovery Room Podcast. In this episode, I am not a tumor, treating the person and not just the disease. We welcome gynecological oncologist, Dr. Elizabeth Dixon. We'll talk about fostering open communication, discussing goals, making shared decisions, and how addressing the psychological and emotional aspects of a patient's journey impacts their overall health outcomes. Whether you are podcast watching or listening, I appreciate you being here. I'm cancer physical therapist, Dr. Leslie Walke. Please hang around till after the show as I'll offer you your episode recap and you will learn how you and I can engage directly in my incredible cancer survivorship membership group, Recovery Room Plus. This is the Recovery Room Podcast, discussing all things cancer recovery, bringing you the accurate information and next steps you need to be more confident make better decisions, and live your best life after cancer. Dr. Elizabeth Dixon, welcome to the Recovery Room Podcast. Uh, it is always a blast to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. All Very right. excited to be here. So you have the tongue twister of all tongue twister <laughs> job descriptions. <laughs> you are a gynecological oncologist. It's yes. lots of C's and lots of G's. Lots of C's and G's. Um, so you deal with um, females and or people that were born with female body parts. Um, and those body parts are, list them off. So ovary, uterus, fallopian tube, cervix, vulva, vagina. So anything below the belt, essentially, with the lady parts. Gotcha, gotcha. And unfortunately, like all of the body parts, those body parts can get cancer as well. Correct. Yeah. Correct. All right. So I'm excited to talk to you about this because it's not it's not always a typical topic when we talk about cancer or healthcare. But what we're talking about today is how from a medis the medicine side and from the patient side, making sure that we are treating a person and not just the disease. Um, right. especially in cancer care, because we're so focused, which of course, rightfully so, we got to get rid of that crap. It's dangerous. Right. Um, right. But I'm excited to talk to you about it because um, it's really, really important. And with the prevalence of cancer going up and up and up because of our larger population and our aging population, we're seeing more people and it's impacting more people. So I think it's, it's right. nice that it's starting to finally get attention. There is, um, you may be familiar with this, quote, and for people of a younger generation may not be familiar of uh, older folks might be a, a physician. I think he graduated from um, medical school like in the early 70s, and he was kind of the father of patient-centered care. Um, his name was right. Patch Adams, and he was just a very a huge outlier and was the, one of the first physicians that, that talked about empowering patients and seeing patients as people, God forbid. Um, and it was just, it was so brand new back then. But one of his favorite quotes it always sticks with me. And it's, it goes something like, um, if you treat a disease, you're going to win some and you're going to lose some. But if you treat a person, you will never, ever lose. Um, and that is so cool. Um, and I think especially because cancer care, nobody wants to be a patient, but it's, it, it can be very, very difficult place to work sometimes. Right. Um, but when you approach it like that, it really is a wonderful way to think about things. So I'm really excited to talk to you about um, about this because I know you as a physician do take care of, of people that, that just happen to have a, an ugly, ugly disease. So right. um, let's just right out of the gate talk about the big one is so how in your experience does does addressing the psychological needs, the emotional aspects of a patient's cancer treatment plan, you know, the diagnosis, the treatment, and then the, the, the surveillance in survivorship and all that stuff, it's just huge. Um, how does addressing those things during and after really impact outcomes for these people that we're taking care of? Right. So it really does because having the mindset of this is something that is happening, but it's not me. 
It's not who I am. And making sure to kind of separate the disease from the patient yeah. and who they are. Yeah. And so coming at the diagnosis state where patients don't know what's happening to them. They didn't ask for this. They have no clue. No. And as what I usually start with patients and say, you didn't ask to be in my office. Right. Nobody wants to be in my office. It's kind of like the dentist, but worse. Yeah. So what can we do to try and calm those nerves and understand that we are walking through this journey together mm -hmm. and it's not a journey that you ever asked for. Right. Nobody's right. saying that. It's more that this is what's happening now in this moment and we're going to figure out what to do in the next step and then the next step and the next step yep. to try and treat this disease. But you still have to try and figure out how to be yourself during that time. Yep. And if you do, we know patients do better if they decrease their stress level, if they try and keep things as normal as possible. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when you're coming in to get chemotherapy, things are not normal. This is not normal life. Right. But how do you, when you step outside of that chemotherapy, how do you keep what you're doing on a daily basis as normal as possible mm -hmm. so you feel like you? Do you take the kids to school? Do you go to that PTO yep. meeting? Do you go play bowling? You know, do you go to your bowl league? How do we get you to those things during mm -hmm. your treatment? Because we know those patients do better. They just right. overall do better. Yeah. When they have the outlook like, this is something that I have to treat kind of like a hypertension yeah. or a diabetes. This is not me. This is not who I am. This is not my heart and soul. Mm -hmm. My heart and soul is my family. My heart and soul is my business. Yeah. My heart and soul is my pet. My heart and soul is my, you know, bowling league or, yeah. or whoever. That's who is what's important to me. How do we keep with all of that while you're going through treatment? Yeah. Because on the other side, if we've treated your disease, but have killed you as a person, what have we done? Right. We haven't done it. Ex exactly. I'm like, that's why I say if, if, because obviously the goal of healthcare, the goal of medicine is to destroy cancer, eliminate cancer, minimize risk of right. the cancer coming back. Um, that's, that is technically a good outcome. That's the outcome everybody wants. But again, the outcome right. at the expense of mental right. health, physical exactly. health, sexual health, that has major consequences. Um, it does. So, uh, you know, again, what's the point of curing somebody's cancer if we trash them in the process? They can't be who they are, who they, and some people want to go back to exactly who they were before. That's fine. I want to, I want to shut the door right. on this, walk away. I, I don't want the ribbons and crap. I just want to go back to where I was. Other people are like, no, right. okay, this is a, you know, this is a warning sign. I want to make changes. I want to be different. I want to be better, whatever. Right. And that's all fine. Um, but how can we help? people do that um right because and, and, and it's even, talking to them about the it's talking to them about those goals right yeah what is your goal yeah so we have <laughs> right. short-term goals we have short-term goals and we have long-term yeah. goals most patients at the diagnosis the long-term goal is to get the cancer to go right. away but what do we do in the short term and what are your goals in the short term is your goal today to just get through chemo yeah is your goal next week to finish chemo but then go on a vacation like what are your goals and are we addressing your goals and if that goal with treating the cancer flips to where your goal is not to treat the cancer anymore, your goal is to just be you, right? then we got to figure out how to do that. Yep. 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 I think people get so stuck in, I have to listen. I have to be told, I don't know what to do. Therefore, I'm just going to listen and do what I'm told. And part of that is, I mean, you're, you, you are picking physicians because that's what you want them to do is tell you, you know, give you the best option and then you go for that. But again, people that are, as you said, less stressed better educated, more calm, are going to be able to learn better, um, hear better, participate better. And that, it, and that typically leads to better decision making. <laughs> and, and, and that is something that we now are moving more towards. It used to be very autonomous. Yeah. Doctor says X, you do X. Yeah. Now it is more of a shared decision model. Yes. So we are sharing this decision. I am giving you, and sometimes it's frustrating for patients. Oh, wrong. it's, you know, right? I guess people it's are like, just tell me what to just do. Just tell me what to do. But the thing is that we need to make that decision together. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you these three options. Which of these options sounds like the best one for you? Mm -hmm. Because it's your cancer. It's your diagnosis. It's you, not necessarily all you, but it is what you are going to be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so here are all of our options. We have to pick the right one for you. Yeah. And we're going to make that decision together because the days of us telling you, you do this, it's over. We don't do that anymore. Right. Like we give you options and yeah, 
the options may only be one option. Right. Or only be, this is the only, right. this is one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but your choice is still, do I do it or not? Right. That's the choice. Yes. It may only be one option. Right. But it, do you do it or not? Right. And you can say, no. Yeah. I don't like that option. I'm not doing that. I'm going to get a second opinion, which I do want to point out, it is okay mm -hmm. to get second opinions. And it is okay to find a practitioner or a provider who you feel comfortable with. If you are talking with someone and they're not doing shared decision making, right. if they're not letting you participate in your care, find somebody else who will. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. 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 I will often ask or tell people to ask, again, all cancers are very different. So when you are first diagnosed or you're going through that, that treatment planning and, and biopsy learning kind of imaging series um, is once they kind of have a general idea of what kind, what kind of cancer that is, is to find out how much time you have to safely make a decision. For yes. some cancers, it is you have six hours, you could be dead tomorrow if we don't start treatment. That literally is some, you know, leukemias, lymphomas, that can happen. Yeah. There are some Absolutely. cancers that you could literally have months to make a decision because um, they're right. so slow growing and they're not, at this point, they're not particularly dangerous. So, because I think then you have the ability to, to, to ask more questions, to, to feel a little bit less stressed. If you, if you do fall in the zone of like, you know, you do have a couple weeks, there's no need to rush this. You have the opportunity right. to talk to other people, talk to, you know, um, um, other, uh, other physicians and, um, that can, that can be really, really important, um, because it does feel like such an emergency situation. Um, right. so I say, is, is this an emergency or is this urgent or is this, you can take some time and, and, and do the best thing for you. Right. Um, right. I'll also tell patients that, um, because sometimes in, in retrospect, it can be such a blur. They're like, <laughs> it was such a blur. I, I don't know, know what happened. happened. I don't, right. I don't right. remember talking. I don't remember decisions. It just, it was just boom, 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 boom. We just did this. And then they start to panic. Like, did I make the right decision? And right. I will often say to people, you probably did because if you made a poor decision that was going to put your risk at your health at risk, your physician team would have said, wait a minute, that is your right. option, but exactly. this puts you at very high risk. They would have, they're not right. going to say, oh, you can choose to step in front of a car if you want to, that'll kill your cancer, <laughs> you know, um, cause it, it would cure your cancer. One way it will. We don't recommend that. But so if you say, I want to do that, they're like, well, you, we can't, and again, it's your choice, but if right. they would let you know, if you were yeah. doing something that was definitely putting your health at yeah. risk. So for all of you out there are like, oh my God, did they make the right decision? They're not going to let you make a bad one. Or if you do make right. a bad one or a one that's less optimal, they're going to let you know. We've at least talked about it. Yeah. They're going to, you're going to, it's, it's going to be a conversation. Um, right. because I have had patients over the years, um, that have chosen not to do chemotherapy because they did not, they're losing their hair was so averse to them, yes. you know, or if they lost, if they did chemo, they might lose their job. You know, they may not be able to go to work. And if they didn't go to work, they would lose their job. Even though that's illegal, they know if I don't go, I will lose my job. I cannot lose, you know, there, there's things that, that play in decisions right. that may not to be, may not be optimal. But again, right. you're the job of the physician is to say, okay, these are the choices. This is the consequence of these choices. You know, exactly. it, may, it may modify your risk a little bit, um, but right. you got to do, you got to do you. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, how do you foster open communication with your patients to kind of, so for them to understand shared decision-making and then plus how that, how do you understand um, their unique needs beyond their medical care? Well, I think the biggest thing is our first consultation to talk to them and say at the end of that, you're not going to remember half of what I said. Exactly. And that's okay. Just verbalize the fact that you're not going to remember yeah. half of what I said today. And that's okay. <laughs> But that you should always ask questions. Yes. You know, I would say that the apps that we use for our um, online uh, electronic medical mm -hmm. record that we now can do messages to providers is a blessing and a curse. Yeah. I will be very honest. It's both. Yep. Because I think it's very good for patients to be able to write down their, their questions in a nice, con con concise ma manner. But the problem is a lot of those questions need talking and they need discussion and it's not an easy answer. Right. So I do definitely have tell patients, you know, send us a message through that live well thing, you know, make sure that your questions are asked. But I also, with the caveat that I might not be able to answer it in a message and that we might need to have a phone conversation mm -hmm. or a conversation mm -hmm. in person or things like that. But 
having venues for patients to be able to ask those questions and the open door to be able to do that, I think is huge because some patients don't think they can ask questions, but at the end of the first discussion saying, any questions you have, just send us a note, call our office, any questions at all. And if it's something we can't help you with, say it's a question that's actually not in our wheelhouse, we'll figure out right. who we can find to answer that question for you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think just having that open door and the ability to ask those questions um, is huge for patients, yeah. for sure. And I, I want to emphasize a point that you brought up earlier that is so important is a lot of physicians may not ask, even if they get to know and have open communication, may not ask the patient their goals. Right. Okay. Oh um, yeah. And absolutely. that is, so if it doesn't come up in your conversation, well, even, and even if you're in pain, if you're in cancer survivorship, you can still have goals when you talk to your physician oh, yeah, and they may not absolutely. ask. I mean, again, that your, your goal may be, I don't care what happens. I will do everything possible regardless of expense, toxicity. Um, you know, I, I need to do everything I possibly can to get rid of this cancer. Um, even if you right. need to take off my left leg and my right arm, just get rid of it. You know, um, and other people are like, okay, I want to get rid of this, but the, here's my line in the sand. I don't, I will not do this. Right. I don't want to do this. This is important to me. I don't want to lose that. And that is all okay. There's no one way yes. that people have to act. Um, right. And I, I think that sometimes, and I don't think, I don't, I don't see much of it as now as I did decades ago, but I mm -hmm. always think there used to be this kind of, and maybe it's still a little subtly out there that people want to be good patients. So their doctors will take care of them and, and make sure they cure them. <laughs> like, you know what, if you, if you get in a fight with your doctor, your cancer's not going to care. It's, it's not going to care. You're going to get better either way. So if you right. bump heads, I mean, obviously you have to have open communication, but if you're, if you are get cranky someday, your doctor's not going to fire you. They're not no. going to stop caring for you. They're not going to give you the no. wrong medicine. They're just not going to do that. But that's just human nature to feel okay. I have to be a good person because I want everything to go okay. Well, and to kind of go along with that, if you're not gelling, if it's not just a one-off yeah. and it was a bad day and you just didn't, things just didn't go well. And the next time it was fine and everything was okay. But if you're, if you're not gelling with your provider yeah. in a way that you feel like you're heard, it is okay to try and find someone who is going to listen to mm -hmm. you. That's okay. And I know a lot of patients come and say, you know, I didn't leave that other provider because I was afraid of what was going to happen right. to me. No, doc, no provider, no anyone, honestly, who's taking care of patients would feel it is something that they would then have to be retaliatory right. about if you're going to find another provider to right. do your care. Yeah. It just, it didn't click. It didn't work. Yeah. We are not gelling. You need to find somebody who you do gel with and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people, especially if you live in a, in a, in a city where you have multiple Either it's a large institution Choices. that you have different yeah. positions to pick from, or you have multiple health systems in the same city or the same general. And but even for people that live in the middle of nowhere, you might get one person to talk to. Um, right. But even in that, there's probably going to be other people in the office. So if it's a right. nurse practitioner or a physician assistant um, or a, even a, even a medical assistant, you know, you can still ask questions. So if if you're not if you're bumping heads with somebody there, you know, say okay, if I have more questions, who can I talk to? You know, right. cause there may be somebody right. that has more time. Physicians are just so crunched for time now, um, yeah. that maybe they don't have enough time to answer your questions to the depth that would be best for you. But maybe there's somebody, you know, down the hallway that has five or 10 minutes that can answer that question. So I think right. that just asking more questions and expecting that to be normal, um, is, is also going to be very, very, a great strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. And I'm of the opinion that healthcare needs to be improved like everything always, but I don't know that healthcare is broken. I don't like when I, I don't like that when people are here that because we do provide some of the best healthcare on the, on the planet, but we can improve and there's lots of right. things that we don't do well. So how, um, how do you feel that healthcare providers, um, physicians, um, can better integrate mental health support, sexual health support, just psychological support into cancer care in general? I think a lot of us get so focused on the cancer, honestly. Yeah, because yeah, that's of course. What we're supposed and that's, to be I think that's your job. <laughs> yeah, it's our job, but we don't we don't look on the outside mm -hmm. of all that stuff. And so, uh, actually, there was a study that I, I was doing in fellowship where we looked at asking the question about sexual health mm -hmm. and the fact that most practitioners do not ask that question. Yes, and yes. is that because we don't feel comfortable asking that question? Mm -hmm. But if we did ask that question, would 
patients want us to. Right. And it was actually shocking because at least some of the patient population that we work with don't want to ask that question, don't want to listen to that question. And so I think it really is, I think what we can do to answer your question, improve on our cancer care is really about the goals. Because if a patient comes in and says, my goal is to talk about my sexual function and how I can fix that Mm -hmm. and how I can improve it, then great. But that might not be the person down the hallway's right. goal. And if you bring up that sexual question, they might go, <gasps> yeah. what are we talking about? Yeah. Like, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. And so it really is about asking goals. I think that's a perfect example on how we can do better and find out what our patient's goals are from the get-go. Yeah. So um, just out of curiosity, um, how much did you learn in medical school about this? Or was this all just kind of learned on the job (laughs) and in fellowship and hanging out with other physicians going, oh, okay, this is the stuff they don't teach in school. (laughs) Yes. Well, but the thing is school, uh, since we went, my class went, it's changed dramatically. It's dramatically changed. And so I don't, I honestly can't speak to what the new docs are coming out Mm -hmm. learning um, because it has changed. They've been much more of a patient centered, much more patient focused. And so I think it's different now for sure yeah. than when we went. Um, I think those of us who went a while ago still are catching up with all of that mm-hmm. stuff, but I think the newer docs are much better at asking goals and goal oriented questions yeah. and having it be patient centered. Yeah. Yeah. I even see that in my profession too. I think, you know, it's still the education is phenomenal. Um, and, um, but I think again, I call them kids, <laughs> these kids coming out of school these days. Um, right. Um, I think they, again, they don't have the experience, but they just are, they think about things differently. They see things differently. And they're certainly approaching things that we didn't, we didn't even think about for sure. Right. Um, They certainly have a breadth and depth of, of knowledge that, that it took us, you know, time to, to find, but kind of in your parting shot here, what, what, um, if somebody doesn't feel like they are being treated as a whole person and they are just a disease, what, what recommendations do you have? wrap it up for us. Well, first thing I would do is talk, Yeah. talk to the provider, talk. And if it, and if they aren't receptive to that, talk to someone in their office, say, Hey, I don't feel like I'm being treated as a person. I don't feel like my goals are being addressed and then try and work it out. You know, some, sometimes we are so in our heads, we don't realize what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's because we don't understand what's going on because we're human too. Yes, exactly. So maybe, we didn't know, or we didn't know your goal today was to talk about going on that vacation. I didn't know that. And unless you tell me that, I just think we're doing the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. So talking to somebody saying, Hey, my goal is not being met. I don't feel like a person. And then if it still doesn't mesh, then find a provider who will treat you that way. But I think the first step is really to open those lines of communication and make sure that they know how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Because if it comes out of left field, how am I supposed to know? that you're feeling this way unless you tell me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important because you may see 30 people in a day and they all have the same cancer, but each of those 30 people may feel like, okay, I'm your 30th person with cancer today, but they, you are the 30th completely individual person that's Different. coming in through the Correct. door. Um, yes. And I will often run into um, is people will come in and say, well, I don't want to complain. And I'm like, well, you're not complaining. You are telling me about your symptoms. Right, correct. <laughs> and and exactly. it's the same with physicians and nurses. If, if you don't tell us what's wrong and if you don't complain or slash share your symptoms, we can't fix what we don't know about. Right. So I would right. encourage people to just lay it all out there. People are going to love you, yes. whether you, you know, spew for five minutes or four minutes or three minutes. Um, we're going to love you the same. We're going to treat you the same. But again, the more we know, um, the better we can take care of all of that stuff. So absolutely, um, communication is the key for sure, for sure. Yes. So Dr. Dixon, thank you so much for spending your time with thank us today. Thank you so much on... for having me. Yeah, thank it's good you. stuff. I appreciate it. I'm hoping this is yes. very helpful for the audience. And um, in the comment section, guys, leave your experiences, whether positive or negative, that you had with somebody on your healthcare team when it came to, did you feel like a disease or did you feel like a person that just happened to have a disease? All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. I love having you in my listener community. So if you haven't already, please follow and subscribe to The Recovery Room on YouTube and Facebook and to The Recovery Room podcast. 
Please share these wonderful free resources with your support groups, family, friends, and medical teams. I also have an incredible Cancer Survivor Community membership group called Recovery Room Plus. I'd love for you to consider joining. In Recovery Room Plus, you get direct interaction with me, in-depth cancer recovery info and experts, and really cool live events like yoga, book discussions, cooking demos, member meets, and much more. I would love to connect with you. You can learn more at recoveryroomplus.com. The link is in the show notes. For your episode recap, we spoke with gynecological oncologist, Dr. Elizabeth Dixon. We discussed the need to have your medical team understand your unique needs and concerns beyond just the medical aspect. You should feel you are being heard, are part of decision-making, and have a voice in your treatment goals. If this doesn't ring true for you, step back and examine the options you have to improve your relationships with your care team. Only together can we better integrate mental health support into the standard of care for people with cancer. Thanks again for tuning in. Remember, you have one life and one body. Care for them both well. Let's talk again soon. 